half today. I'll start recording now. So uh, we move to the unit impulse function. The delta function, we discussed it last time. I think there is one piece that I didn't mention, so I'll go over it quickly and then we'll continue from there. So the delta function is defined as you see in the definition box up there. It's defined as it's equal to zero everywhere in time except at t equals zero. When you go to t equals zero, we don't really have any definition for the shape of the function itself, but we say that the total integral under that function is equal to one, which means that the total area under whatever curve that we can't and we don't see and we cannot identify how it looks like, that curve that we cannot see has a total area underneath it equal to one, okay? So that's the second part of the definition, this integral that you see uh, on this side of the definition, okay? Again, I gave you a quick example. You can imagine that it is a rectangular function with height one over epsilon and a width equal to epsilon, and then you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. So this becomes very small, but at the same time, this height grows to become very large. That's one way. You can think of a triangle that behaves the same with a total area equal to one underneath. You can think of two exponentials, one on the positive side, one on the negative side, and they become closer to each other until it becomes very tall and they almost touch zero, very close to zero. You can imagine many ways to define that. That's why we don't have a specific shape for the delta function. One thing I forgot to mention last time, and since we are going through it, I'll mention it. So how do we represent that function graphically? We just represent it by an arrow located at the location of the delta function. So here we have delta of t. So the function exists around zero. So the arrow exists around zero. And the height of the arrow is equal to the area under the curve. So if the area under the curve is one, the height of the arrow is one, right? Now, if I say, for example, plot three delta instead of just delta. So we know for delta of t, the total area is equal to one. What about three delta of t? The area is equal to three, right? Because you multiply that by three, right? So in that case, the arrow is still at zero, but it becomes taller rather than being of height equal to one. It becomes of height equal to three. So the, the height of the arrow, just a graphical representation of what's the total area under the delta function. But it doesn't really represent the actual shape of the delta function. We don't know what's the shape and how it looks like, okay? Um, so this height of the arrow is the area under the curve. Any questions about this part before I move forward? Okay. Yes. I am. I'm just not showing it here. So don't worry. Okay. Okay, so based on the properties of the delta function, we can use that function mathematically to perform some operations that were not easy to do and represent mathematically. Not to do, do the operation is easy to do it practically or implemented in a system or whatever. But the problem is how do I represent that operation mathematically? It was difficult before the definition of the delta function. After we define the delta function, one important operation that the delta function is used for is if you want to represent picking a sample from a signal. I have a continuous signal. For example, signal looks like this. Right? Any continuous signal. And I want to represent the operation of just picking a sample of this signal at a particular point. Right? So doing that operation before was kind of mathematically to represent it, it's not easy. With the delta function, it enables performing that operation in a mathematically convenient way. Okay? Why it's mathematically convenient, we will see that in the coming parts of the course. We will not see it immediately. But now we will focus on how we can use the properties of the delta function to perform this operation, picking a sample of a curve. Okay? First of all, if I call this curve x of t, okay, and my target is to just write this value, what should I say? If this value, for example, is a t, at capital T, what should I say? What should I write mathematically? Forget about the delta function now. What would you write mathematically to represent the value of that x of t at the point capital T? What would you do? Exactly. You would simply say this value is x of capital T. So instead of being a function of any value of t, you are specifying that I'm looking for 
the value of the function at this particular point in time can be zero. Okay, for example, if this, I mean, sometimes when you make things uh, with numbers, it becomes easier to understand. So let's look, for example, at this curve. That's a simple one. So x of t is equal to uh, t with a slope equal to 1. Okay? And I want to get the value of this at uh, t equals 3, for example. Okay, so I want this value, the value of the curve at t equals 3. What would you do? You would actually go and substitute here t equals to 3, and you'd tell me that this is the value. But when you want to write this mathematically, you will tell me x at t equals 3. So we call that x of 3. Because it is equal to t, so I will substitute 2 to 3. So that value is equal to the numeric value 3, right? So this is how we represent mathematically poking, picking this point. And then based on the equation of that curve, we figured out that it is equal to a particular value. That's just a numeric value picked from that curve, right? Clear to everyone? That's very simple. Tamam? Time. Now, let's look at what happens when the first uh, part of this slide, which is called multiplication property. What happens when you multiply a delta function with any general function, we call it phi of t. Any general function, like this x of t that we have here. So let's imagine that this x of t is called phi of t instead of x of t. Okay? And then I multiply this by a delta function Right, so this is delta of t minus tau. First of all, sorry, if this is delta of t, which exists at zero, this is delta of t. What would delta of t minus three look like? From the properties that you learned about signals. It's shifted to the right, so that the arrow and the value of the function, which we don't know how much is it, will exist around three, and instead of being around, so it will be this delta represented by the arrow, but it's happening at three instead of happening at zero, right? Now imagine that I have a general function, phi of t, this guy, and I multiply this by delta of t minus capital T, so a delta that exists at location, capital T, right? What's gonna be the output of this multiplication? Yeah, so why five five? Five, five. You mean five? This is not five. This is five of me. Five. A general function five. Okay. So, if I multiply a delta with this curve, what will happen? The curve everywhere is multiplied by a zero, 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 except at the location of the delta, right? And at the location of the delta is multiplied by what? By a delta, right? I, I don't know. I cannot put a number because I don't know how the delta looks like, right? So the result is, if I have any general function phi of t multiplied by a delta at zero in this case, then the outcome of that is going to be the value of the function at the location of the delta, phi of zero, which is this point, multiplied by the delta as is, right? So instead of having a full function multiplied by the delta, the result is going to be the function is going to cancel everywhere because it's multiplied by zero everywhere, except at this point, the function at this point is phi of capital T, in this case, capital T is equal to zero, multiplied by the delta as is. Why I didn't change the delta? Because I don't know how it looks like at that point, right? I know that the delta is around zero, but I don't know anything about it around zero except that it is a delta. I don't know how big is the value. I only know that the area, but the area requires integration, right? But as a function, it just stays as a delta, okay? Sorry? Because what's the definition of the delta? Again, we are multiplying what? We are multiplying this function with this function, which is zero everywhere, right? And this function has values everywhere, right? So when you multiply, what do you do? Take this value, multiply it by this, gives you a result. This one multiplied by this, this one multiplied by this, and so on. So the function multiplied by zero, by zero, by zero, except at the delta, it's multiplied by delta, and then zero, zero, zero. So the result is going to be a delta, but instead of being a delta of t minus capital T, for example, it's going to be this delta, but the arrow is going to grow up with the value phi at that capital T. The value of the function, which is this one, phi at capital T, this value is multiplied by the area of the delta. 
Right? Yes. Uh, it should be delta minus two. This is a mistake. Yeah, this this writing, this writing has a mistake. Yeah. Yes. This is delta of t minus capital T as it is. It stays the same delta. No change happens to the delta. Okay? That's a mistake. Good. Thank you. Okay? So you got the idea of what we are trying to say here? If you have a function and that function is multiplied, we, we only did multiplication, we didn't do anything else with a delta, it's as if the delta has picked only that value of the function and it became its magnitude, and then the rest of the function disappears, right? So we stay with the delta scaled by the value of the function at that location. This is kind of the first step of sampling from the function, right? Because I only picked one value of the function, and it became the magnitude of the delta, right? Now, using the second property, if I go and integrate this expression, so I ended up here with this expression, phi of capital T, delta of T minus capital T. That's the result of the first step of multiplying a delta with my function. Now imagine if I go and try to integrate this from minus infinity to infinity. How would I do this integral? Don't forget that the integration is with respect to time in general. So this is integration dt. Let me take it outside. So I have phi of capital T multiplied by delta of time minus capital T. That's the delta at location T, right? At location capital T. And then I integrate this from minus infinity to infinity dt. What's going to be the result? First of all, the phi of capital T is a constant. So it goes outside the integral, right? Okay, so I end up with phi of capital T outside and then integration from minus infinity to infinity, delta of T minus capital T dt. What's this integral? It's the total area under the delta function. What's the total area under delta function by definition? One. So you end up with what? Phi of t, and this whole thing is just one, right? So what did we do now? Through multiplication with a delta, that was the first step of the first property, I picked that value, but still that value was multiplied with a delta function. Through integrating from minus infinity to infinity, the delta function disappeared, and I ended up with one multiplied by the value of the function at that location. So as if I picked the phi of capital T using multiplication with delta and then integration. We call that the sampling operation. I want to pick this particular value from the function. I multiply the function with a delta. That's the first step. What will happen? The function will disappear everywhere, and it will become a scaling of a delta at the location of the delta. Then I take that result, and I integrate it from minus infinity to infinity using the property of the delta, the second part of the definition of the delta. I know that that integral is going to give me 1. So I end up with phi of t, which is a sample from the function at location capital T. OK? So that's how we use the delta function to perform sampling of other functions. Okay? Why is this useful? Why we can just write from the beginning phi of capital T and so on? We will see later on when we come. This is going to appear actually towards the end of the course when we talk about sampling and how you move from analog or continuous domain to discrete domain. And then. For now, can we just try sampling? Sorry? No, no. For now, we need to be able to perform this operation. Just the operation. But why we need to perform it this way? You're going to use it later, and then later in the DSP course. OK? OK? So these are kind of two important properties of the delta function uh, that allows us to perform those operations that I talked about. The last property of the delta function, and let me just try to clean things a little bit. No, I can't. Okay. okay. Uh, the last one, which is in the slide, but we have lots of writing above it, is the fact that the delta function of t 
is actually the derivative of the unit step function. So that allows us to relate the delta and the unit step. Okay? Uh, if you have a unit step function that, for example, u of t, and then you take the derivative of that, the result of the derivative is going to be the delta function by definition. Okay? And this means that you can, exactly, you can achieve the unit step function by integrating from minus infinity to some time value delta of tau d tau by integrating the delta function. Um, just a question. Uh, why do we write tau here uh, if we use t here? Just to remove confusion. And this is called typically in mathematics, it's called just using a bounding variable, right? Because now we move the time, the actual time variable that corresponds to this time, we moved it to the limit of the integral, so we have to use another dummy variable inside, not the same name of the one in the integral uh, operation, okay? Okay, few interesting stuff. Here is how the delta, for example, let's say I have delta of t minus three. So that's a delta function with value one, right? The height of the arrow, and it exists at point t equals three in time. Okay. And I ask you this question. What's going to be the integral of this delta of t minus 3 dt if I integrate from minus infinity up to 0? What's the result of that integral? 0. Why? Hmm? Yeah. So... Look, look at what I incorporated inside the integral. Again, it's the delta function, which is this guy, which is zero everywhere, except at t equals three, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm integrating this curve, which is zero everywhere, except at three, and I'm integrating it from minus infinity up to zero. What did I accumulate? Zero, nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So be careful, the integral of the delta function is not always zero. Uh, sorry, it's not always one. It's one given that you have already incorporated the location of the delta inside that integral, right? So the general integral from minus infinity to infinity, yes, it's always one. But if you integrate with limits different from minus infinity to infinity, make sure you look at the curve and you figure out this region of integral. Does it include the location where the arrow of the delta exists or not? If it doesn't include that, then the result of the integral is equal to zero. If it includes that, then the result of the integral is equal to one, right? And this is why we can say that u of t, so why do we say that u of t is equal to the integral from minus infinity up to the value t, delta of tau d tau? Why do we say it this way? Look at the now my my time is tau and this is where my delta of tau is right okay and now try to solve this integral for different values of t because you want to get the unit step for different values of t right if i solve this integral for any value of t smaller than zero what happens so if i integrate up to t so if i'm looking for example to u of minus one what's u of minus one the unit step function is zero at minus one, right? Is that true from the integral? Yes, because if I integrate from minus infinity up to minus one, I stopped here. So I did not incorporate the delta function with me in the integral. So yes, the result of this integral is gonna be zero for any negative small t. And then once the small t goes beyond zero, the result of the integral is gonna be equal to, which means that this integral can be written as it's equal to zero for any t smaller than zero, and it is equal to one for any t greater than or equal to zero. Isn't this exactly what the unit step looks like? So that's why when we want to say the relation between the unit step and the delta function, we write it in this form. Okay? The integral from minus infinity up to any time t of the delta function at zero. Okay? Yes, you have a question. Uh, 
even if we say the integral from 2.3 or 2.9 up to 3.1 of this delta of t minus 3 dt, this is also equal to 1. Because I started here, I finished here, so I incorporated the delta with me. So the total result is going to be the area of the delta, which is 1. Now, so we stopped now at, we finished now what we need to do in terms of signals. And we have to move to the other part of the course talking about systems uh, themselves. Before we go there, any questions about what we uh, have been through so far? So the delta, the unit step function, the relation between them, how you can use the delta to do sampling, properties of the delta, definition of the delta function, because we use the delta function a lot later on. So if you have any confusion related to that, you can either ask now or you need to specify office hours. I just got your uh, empty slots yesterday from the department. So I will check and send you suggested fixed location office hours. Might not find because I looked at it. There is no slot where you are all available except the break. And we cannot have an office hour in the break because you are supposed to use it for something else. So I will specify fixed office hour. And then I will allow others who are not available during that to ask for appointments if they want. We agree upon the available time. Okay. Um, and back to what we are discussing here. So we are finished with signals. The other important part of this course is talking about systems. Why do we need systems? Because this is the block or the part where we do some operations on those signals to get some output that we desire, some output signal as well, but we desire. I have the voice of someone, right? And I want to identify who's the speaker. So I need a system that takes the, the voice as an input signal and then produces at the output an identification of the speaker. This is Aisha, this is Tamir, this is Ali, this is Ibrahim, and so on. Right? Okay? So that's called a system. Now, in terms of how systems are uh, defined in general, they are, you can think of it as blocks or um, equipment or whatever that are used to process input signals in order to produce some desired output signal. That's a general kind of rough definition of what a system is. Generally speaking, systems can be with multiple inputs and multiple outputs, right? So I can have more than one input going into my system and I can have, have more than one output. As far as we are concerned in this course, we will talk only about single input, single output system, okay? The expansion into multiple input, multiple outputs is straightforward. Requires a little bit more mathematical processing, but it's very straightforward. It's left for not even your next course in digital, but it's actually for graduate level. So multi-input, multi-output is going to come in graduate level if you continue studies in this domain. But as far as we are concerned, we'll focus only on a single input, single output system. Not only that, Later on, when we discuss properties of the system, you will see that we are only addressing in this course a specific type of system, not all the different types of single input, single output systems. We'll come to that in a couple of slides, okay? <laughs> Generally speaking, systems can be represented in many ways. Uh, and this uh, slide shows how systems can be represented. Either you represent the system by writing what's going to be the shape of the input signal, x of t, and then an arrow, and then the shape of the output signal. So an example of this, I would say I have a system that takes, for example, x of t as an input, and the output is going to be x of t under the root square, right? So this system, what does it do? It takes the square root of whatever signal coming into it, right? So that, 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 that expression is equivalent to, if I go to that presentation, this expression is equivalent to, in this case, in the other presentation, is equivalent to y of t is equal to the root of x of t. Those two things are representing exactly the same system. A system that takes x of t at the input produces the root of that at the output, presented with the formal input-output expression, is the same system that can be represented in the input-output function expression as y of t is equal to the root of X of t. These are two equivalent ways to present the same system. What does this system do? It takes an input signal and produces the root square of that signal at the output. Okay? Any questions? 
Next is the other way called pictorial or block, block diagram representation. And in this case, we have the input and the output. And typically here, we specify the function of the system. So we say the root of dot, right? So we say that this system is performing the root square operation. What is it going to perform that on? Of course, on the input. And what will be the result of that is going to be your output. Okay? So we represent the function of the system on the block itself. There are a couple of formal ways to present the function of a system. We will come to them in the next chapter. Yes? So we don't show the operation in the output, right? No, no. Forward. Typically, 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 in this case, we show the operation on the system itself. However, in some block diagrams, people might do the other way. So say x of t, and then rather than saying y of t here, they would say the root of x of t. So you know that this system has performed the root operation. Because now you see that if it gets an input x, it produces the root of that x, right? But typically, for the pictorial representation, we present the function of the system itself. So input okay. and output are always signals? Sorry? The input and output are always signals. Signal. They are always signals. Any other questions about the representation of signals? So most of the time, we'll be using either this or this. OK? This is seldom used, except in specific branch of signal studies that talks about signal flow grams and so on. And we are not addressing that in this course. But I might, in, in, in the assignment coming this week, I might give you like a couple of these just to get you trained on using this presentation. Uh, for signals, but it's not something that will carry on with us for the rest of the course, okay? Typically, we'll use one of those two. Some examples of signals, uh, sorry, of systems. Uh, the squaring system, so y of t is equal to the square of the input. That's one example. This system, which says that the output is equal to the input shifted by 2. This is basically a delay system. Whatever input you put is produced at the output, but two seconds later, right? So that's basically, we call that a delay system. That's the operation that it does. Amplify a system, a system that takes a particular input and then multiplies that by a certain constant. The constant might be greater than 1. In this case, it amplifies the signal. Or it might be smaller than 1. Then in that case, we call, we call it attenuating the signal. Right? If it makes it bigger, we call it amplification. If it makes it smaller, we call it attenuation. Okay? And the general form of representing a system as a differential equation, it exists in many um, physical systems, right? So uh, we say, for example, that the derivative of the output with respect to time plus some constant multiplied by the output is equal to a constant multiplied by the input. This whole thing defines an input-output relation between an input and an output of a system, right? And most of the practical systems are presented in something similar to this. Are we going to use uh, differential equations a lot in this course? No. But you have to know that this is one way of representing systems. Okay. Before going into this, and to continue on the statement that I mentioned in the previous uh, slide, we are not going to use the generalized form of presenting systems in terms of differential equations. Because in this course, we mainly focus on how the output is presented as a function of the input. So we call that the black box representation of a system. We don't care about the internals of the system, right? We only present it as a black box representation in terms of input and output relation. That's it, OK? In some other studies, for example, in control systems, people care actually about some other internals of the system. And then they start looking at something called the state space representation of the system and so on. This is more detailed look into systems, but it's outside the scope of this course. Here, we only look at input-output relation, regardless of what happens inside. Okay. Now, if this is the case, there are three ways, in general, three elementary ways to interconnect systems together. Do we need to interconnect systems? Yes. In all engineering applications, you are not dealing with one system that does everything. You have small pieces. We call them subsystems. Each one of them is a system by itself, and it's performing a specific function. And then you pass the output to another one, which is doing another function, until at the end, you get the desired outcome that you are looking for. Okay? So typically, we deal with systems that are in interconnected to each other. There are three ways of this interconnection, three elementary ways 
Of course, in general, you can have a combination of all of these, right? Either you connect them in series, one after the other, which is this one called the cascaded or the series connection, or you connect them in parallel. So the output is the sum of the outputs of those two different systems, or you connect them in a loop, which is called the feedback system, okay? Now, in practice, you will have combinations of these. So maybe, for example, in, this, in the forward direction of the loop, you have two or three connected in series, and maybe in the reverse direction or the feedback direction of the loop, you have two in parallel followed by one in series and so on, right? So you can have many combinations in actual uh, connectivity, but the general elementary ways of doing it is one of those three, okay? Series, parallel, or uh, feedback. Now, at this level, when we are still at the introductory part, I'm only presenting different ways of connecting systems or interconnecting systems. Later on, after we know how we represent these systems with certain functions, we'll go back and revisit this, and then we will see, in this case, what's gonna be the input-output relation if I know the different elements input-output relations, and in the series case, what's gonna be the overall input-output relation if I know the individual ones input-output, and so on, even for the feedback one. Okay, but we'll come to that in a couple of chapters, okay? Many things that I say, I say we come to that, so don't worry. It's okay. Now we look at properties of systems. Similar to what we did for signals themselves, we looked at some properties of signals like periodicity, even and odd, and so on, right? We also look here at properties of systems. There are, there are many properties that you can look at, but as far as we are concerned in this course, we will look only at a subset of properties that are important to us. The first important property is something called linearity. A system is linear if it has two um, conditions that it satisfies together. So it cannot satisfy one and not satisfy the other. It has to satisfy both of them in order for us to say that this is a linear system. Okay? The first property is called the additive, and the second one is called the homogeneity. And I will try to explain them to you in a way that makes it simple to understand, rather than mentioning them in the formal way. So if I have a system, okay, and if I put an input to this system, call it x1 of t, and I go, I measure the output of that system, I find that it produces some output, I call it y1 of t, okay? And then I go to that system again, and instead of putting x1 of t to produce y1, I put some other input, x2 of t, okay? And then I measure the output. Let's say I find the output in that case is y2 of t. So whatever, for example, let's say if I want to put this in numbers, when I was putting, I was putting a cosine omega t into the input, the output was the cosine omega t plus some phase shift, for example. That's the output that was produced for a cosine input. And then I go to that system and the other input that I put after removing the first one, I put another one, which is, for example, e to the t, let's say e to the minus t, and then I measure the output, and I find for that one that I get e to the minus t over 2. That's how it responds to that exponential. If I put an exponential to that system, that's just an example. Huh? I measure the output to see what it produces, it produces this. And if I put that cosine, and I measure the output, I find it producing a cosine with some phase shift. Okay, that's how it behaves, okay? Now, if, if I go now, so if and only if, okay? I go now to this system, and I put at the input the x1 of t plus the x2 of t, right? So I add those two inputs together. I combine them somewhere outside. I make sure that they add to each other. I add the cosine function to the exponential function. And then I take the result of that and I put it into the system and I measure the output. If I find that the output of the system was actually y1 plus y2, so this means that if I have put the cosine omega t plus the e to the minus t, I find that the output is equal to cosine omega t plus phi, right, plus e to the minus t over 2. 
If this is true, if I find that the system does this, when I add the two inputs and put them into the system, the output is simply the addition of the two measured outputs before, then in this case, this is called an additive system. Right? It satisfies the property called additivity, okay? Which means that if I have an individual output for an individual input, and I have another individual output for another input, if I add the two inputs together, the output is the addition of the individual outputs that corresponds to each one of them, then this is called an additive system. Okay, so this is how I test whether a system is additive or not. This is the first property. Okay. Yes? Why the output uh, of the two functions is not the same? Sorry? The output of the two functions are not the same. What do you mean? For Which one is not equal to which one? She's saying what would happen if the output is not the same as mm -hmm. the no. additive. Yes. No, that's not the question. Why? Uh, In relation to formula, we just think it's just that we would... This is how the system we, behaves. We, we don't know why. This is how it behaves with those signals. I'm saying, just giving an example. No, no. I, I didn't specify what this system is exactly doing internally, right? Yeah. I'm just saying that you put some input to it, you measure the output, you find it this value. Okay? You put another input, you measure the output, you find it some other value, right? Yeah. The system is additive if it satisfies that if you add those two inputs together, yeah. the output is going to be the addition. Yeah. I don't care why the outputs came like that. That's not our study focus at this point, okay? Yeah. Why it produced a shifted cosine? Why it produced a scale exponential? I don't care. Now I'm just looking at a particular aspect of this system, which is the additivity, okay? And these are just examples. It can be anything else. Okay? Yes? Doctor, why did we use two inputs? Why we have to like do one input? No, we did not use two inputs. We we used the same input one time to put one signal, oh. another time to put another signal. So we are not talking about two parallel inputs or anything, okay? okay? And then later on we said, okay, add those two signals together to produce something, which is the addition of them, and put that as the input to the system to the system. Okay? Any questions? Any other questions? Okay, the other property is called the homogeneity property. And what does it say? It says that if for a system I put x1 of t and that x1 of t produces some measured output y1 of t, then a system is homogeneous if I put as an input, let's call it k, k. so a scale, k is a constant. A scaled version of the input corresponds to the same scaling of the output without any other change. So if I put into that system, for example, a cosine function, and it was producing a cosine shifted here, if I go at the input and I put an amplified cosine, amplified by three, the output is going to be the shifted cosine, which is the previous output, the shifted cosine, but now amplified by three as well. So whatever you do in terms of amplifying the input or scaling the input, gets you the same output scaled with the same factor. Okay? So if the system satisfies this property, then it is homogeneous. For a linear system, it has to satisfy both properties together. It if it violates only one of them, it's no longer linear, even if it satisfies the other. Okay? So for a system to be linear, both properties have to be Satisfied together. Let's take an example, okay, how we can test a system for linearity. And let's take um, this particular example, for example. Okay, let's take this one. But before this one, let's do one which is simpler. So assume that I have a system y of t is equal to dx of t by dt. Okay, so this is the differentiator system, right? The output is equal to the derivative of the input. And then I ask you, can you check whether this system is linear or not? What would you do? You would go and check the both properties. How would you check both properties? You would say, okay, I assume, you start by assuming, I assume that for an input called x1 of t, the output from this system is going to be something called y1 of t. And for another input called x2 of t, 
the output from this system is going to be some other output, call it y2 of t. And now let's see what will happen if I put x1 plus x2 to check the additive property. Am I going to get at the output y1 plus y2 or something else? Right? So let's start. If I put x1, I get the output y1, right? Per my assumption. I call the output for x1, y1. Then x1 and y1 have to satisfy the system equation. y1 of t is equal to dx1 of t by dt, right? If I put x1 into the input of this system, I will get what's called y1, right? And then if I put x2, I get y2. So it must be that y2 of t also is equal to dx2 of t by dt, right? Okay? This is just, just coming from those initial assumptions that you use to try to test whether this system is additive or not, okay? Now, the next step is, what if I put x1 plus x2 to the input of this system? Hmm. When I put x1 plus x2, what's going to be the expression? D of x1 plus x2 by dt, right? Okay? And this is equal to what? We know from the property of derivative that if you take the derivative of two functions, it's equal to the derivative of the first plus the derivative of the second, right? So this is simply dx1 of t by dt plus dx2 of t by dt, right? And what's this from this equation? y1 of t. And what's this from this equation? y2 of t. So now we showed that when you put two added inputs, x1 plus x2, what you got was the addition of the outputs y1 and y2. So the system satisfies the additivity or not? Yes. It does, right? Okay. What's next to test now? This is not sufficient to say it's linear. The next step is, what if I scale the input? Does the output scale or something else happens to it? So now you test for the homogeneity. Okay? So you say I put x of t, or call it x1, whatever you like, I get y of t. Okay? So this means that dx of t by dt, and I have y of t here, right? If I put this input, this is the output that I get. So to satisfy the system equation, this is what I get. And now say, what if I put ax of t as an input? What's going to be the output? So let's try. If I put ax of t, so a scaled version, and then I apply the system operation on it, which is simply the derivative of that, this is equal to what? If I have a constant multiplied by a function inside the derivative, I can take the constant outside the derivative. So this is equal to a multiplied by dx of t by dt. But we know from here that this is simply y of t. So this is equal to a y of t. So this means that when I scaled the input, the output was scaled with the same factor. So this system is also homogeneous, satisfies both properties. It is linear. Okay. Now, why if in one of those operations it did not satisfy the property, you stop at that point and you say the system is nonlinear. Okay. Is not linear anymore. So test for linearity, you simply apply those operations. Here is an example. Y of t is equal to the real of x of t. Tamam? Is this system linear or not? I am telling you it's not linear. And the reason is once you go through the operation of testing to this system properties, you will have to go through the homogeneity, right? And the homogeneity says what? Don't forget that the scaling factor here can be anything, including a complex number. It doesn't have to be real number. Okay? So let's apply this system to the scaling factor, assuming that the scaling factor is, in general, a complex number. If I have x of t as an input, right? The output is the real part of that, and we call that y of t, right? What if I have some constant, call it k, multiplied by x of t, okay? Where k in general is complex number. What's going to be the output for that? Apply this to the system. The output should be the real of this, 
right? This is the output that you get from a scaling the input, okay? What is this going to be equal to? <laughs> so assume that x in general is complex. Assume that k in general is complex. What's going to happen when you multiply those? You will end up with a complex result. And that complex result is going to be what? The real times the real, right? Mm -hmm. Plus, sorry, minus the imaginary times the imaginary. This is all the real part, right? And then you have real times imaginary, imaginary times real. These all are multiplied by J. So they end up being the imaginary part. And then I'm taking the real of that. So the result is going to be what? Real of K, right? Multiplied by real of X of T, correct? Minus imaginary of K multiplied by the imaginary of X of T. Right? This is what I will get when I scale the input. Is this equal to, is this equal to K multiplied by Y of T? No. Why? Because here in K multiplied by Y of T, you go to this. Y of T was the real of X of T. So this is simply K multiplied by the real of X of T. When you multiply K by the real of X of T, what do you get? You get a complex number, actually. You don't even get a real part, right? So this is equal to, remember, y of t was defined as the real of x of t, right? So this is simply k multiplied by the real of x of t, which is, if you want to expand it, right, is the real of k times the real of x of t, right? Plus j the imaginary of K multiplied by the real of X of T. Correct? Right? Because I have here K, and then by definition, Y of T was defined as the real of X of T, the output for an input called X of T, which is just the real part of that X of T. Right? And then I multiply that by K, I, if I expand the K as real part and imaginary part, this is what I get. Definitely, this is not the same as this. Right? So when you scale the input of this system, it does not correspond to simply scaling the output. They are not equal to each other. So this system does not satisfy the homogeneity, so it's nonlinear. Okay? Halas? You need a little bit more time to absorb this. It's okay. Any questions, type? Why linearity is such an important property for us? Because of two things. Okay. Number one, it allows dealing with the system mathematically later on as we go through the course in a much easier way in terms of trying to calculate outputs that go for certain inputs given that the system is linear. So it allows this calculation to be much easier mathematically. In addition to that, in general, any system in this life, any system that you will deal with, the output of that system is affected by two independent factors. Okay? The first factor is the input itself, which starts at a certain point in time. Let's say it starts at time zero. So once you start putting an input, you will get a corresponding output to that input, right? But there is one more factor which is independent from the input that actually affects the output at any point in time, and that called, that's called the initial state of the system. An example, if you have a circuit composed of a capacitor and a resistor, okay, and you put some voltage into that uh, circuit, the measured output is going to be affected by how you put that input, right? Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, if at the start, you charge the capacitor of that system, right? Before starting putting the input, and at another trial, you don't charge the capacitor, you keep it at zero charge. In both cases, even though you have the same input, the output is going to be different, right? That initial charge of the capacitor is called the initial state of the system. You can imagine in more complicated system, there are many things that defines the initial state of the system. Another example happens actually in computing, right? 
Um, one thing that they teach you when you are doing programming is that sometimes you causes a lot of errors if you just define a variable and you never assign an initial value to it. Because in, in that case, especially if it's a pointer variable, in that case, the variable is going to read whatever garbage is in the memory, right? And then if someone has used this memory before and has stored a certain number there, then your variable will start with some value that you not expect. So they always tell you, set the initial value of the variable to zero and then start doing your logic, right? If you don't do that setting, even though the logic is the same and the inputs, which are maybe other signals that you add to that variable or other operations that you perform on that, right? They are exactly the same, but if you initialize it with zero, it's going to be different from if you leave it to be initialized with anything. So always an output from any system is not just affected by the input, but by the initial state of the system. Okay? Um, based on that, how can we measure the output of the system in general? For nonlinear system, it's very difficult. Okay, you have to solve differential equations and do some complicated stuff to figure out to, to figure out a general expression for the output as a function of the initial condition and the input. For linear systems, there is a property called the decomposition property, which says that for a linear system, if you set the input to zero, so don't put any input to the system, measure the output, what you are getting right now is only affected by the initial condition because you didn't put any input, right? So now you are measuring the effect of the initial condition. Now go and set the initial condition to zero and put an input to the system and measure the output. Now you are measuring output only due to input, no initial condition, right? For linear systems, you can add those two outputs, the one that comes from the initial condition only and the one that comes from the input only. You simply add them together to get the general expression for the output as a function of the input and the initial condition. For nonlinear systems, you don't know how to combine those to get a general expression. Yes, you can measure the output for initial condition. Yes, you can measure the output for the input only. But if you add those together for nonlinear system, it's not going to be similar to when you put this input with that initial condition and try to measure the output. It's going to be something totally different. It's only true that you can sum the two responses to get the general expression for linear systems. For nonlinear systems, you don't know what to do with them. So you cannot get easily a general expression that combines both effects, the initial condition and um, the uh, input effect. Yes? So we, uh, in linear, we add them both? You add both outputs. outputs yes. And that gives you the general expression for any input and any initial condition. And we initialize it with zero. No, no, you initialize it with zero to measure the output. OK. The, the experiment goes as follows, OK? I will go to a system. If I know that this system is linear, I will go to that system. I will set the input to zero, measure the output. This is the response to initial condition of that system, OK? And then I go to the same system, set the initial condition to zero, and put input only. Measure the output. I will get the response for output only, OK? If I add those two. It's the same as if I go to this system and it has any initial condition and I put an input to it. Mm -hmm. So without setting anything, just leave it as it is, put an input, you will get some combined output. That combined output is simply the addition of those two components, the initial condition component and the, um, the input component. Okay? For nonlinear system, you cannot do this operation. But you, you have to solve the differential equation somehow. Okay? Um, another important note is that uh, almost all physical systems are linear if you are doing, dealing with relatively small signals at the input. Small with respect to what? With respect to some system parameters, but let's take the definition now like this, and then later we might, we might, we're not, maybe not going to touch upon this in the, in the course. If we have some time at the end, I, I'm going to explain a little bit more about this. Okay? So generally speaking, if the input is not very large, most of the physical systems can be considered linear systems. Once the input becomes very large, you start uh, experiencing nonlinearities. An example, if you go from your electronics course, for example, if you go to an amplifier and you try to put very large input, what happens? The amplifier saturates. So it stops really simply multiplying the signal by a constant. It starts distorting the signal and the 
amplification factor is no longer a constant. Rather than just being the output is a constant multiplied by the input, you start reaching a saturation range, right? Or in some other systems, if you put too large input, you get clipping, right? A sine wave, but the output cannot produce more than a certain value. So if the sine wave tries to grow much beyond that value, it's just clipped, right? So that makes it a nonlinear system. Okay? So generally speaking, if the input is small, in most of the cases, the relation between the input and the output of physical systems is linear. But in some cases, if you deal with large signals, you have to do other tricks to do something called linearize the system. We are not going to touch on this. In this course, we only care about linear systems. Hello? I told you earlier that we are not only dealing with single input, single output, but we are restricting even more. So in this course, we only care about linear systems only. Non-linear ones are studied in graduate studies. Yes? So like we don't need to check if it's... No, you need, because you need to practice doing this. But later on, you will not deal with nonlinear systems in terms of the rest of operations. Okay? Another important property of systems is called the time invariance property. A system is called time invariant if it satisfies the following property. Assume that this is a general input to the system, and for this input, it produces the output that you see here. Okay? If you go to the input and only shift it by a certain time, nothing happens to the output except that it gets shifted with the exact same time, nothing else. Okay? So if the system satisfies this property, which says that if I shift the input, the only effect that happens to the output is that it gets shifted with the same value, I call this a time invariant system. Otherwise, it's not a time invariant system. Okay? This is represented mathematically by saying if I have x of t as an input to a system, then if I shift the input by a value capital T, what I should get is the same output shifted by the value of capital T. Nothing else. Okay? No change in the shape, no change in anything else. It's just shift, and it has to be shifted with the exact same time duration. Okay? Here is an example. Check those two signals okay, to see whether they are, sorry, two systems to see whether they are time invariant or not. Just keep in mind, I intentionally presented this system using the first presentation method, just for your own practice. But simply, you can consider this as, so I can rewrite this as y of t is equal to dx of t by dt. Right? This is the same as this system. It's exactly the same thing. If I say, if you put x of t, you get at the output dx by dt, it's the same as saying the output as a function of the input is equal to the derivative of the input, right? So anyways, assuming that you have to look at this system, which is this one, exactly the same, is this time invariant or not? So if I shift the input, if I shift x of t, right, what happens to the output? Does it get shifted with the same value or something else happens to it? I think the same, right? Because yeah. t, we will like, substitute for t, yeah. So how do you test that formally? Yes, you are right. Your intuition is right. But how do you test that formally? Let's say that if I have x of t, right, I get at the output dx of t by dt, right? Okay. And I call that y of t. Okay. Now, if I have x of t minus capital T, what do I get at the output? D x of t minus capital T by dt, right? Now I need to compare this with shifted version of y of t. I want to figure out whether this is the same as y of t minus t or not, right? If it is equal to y of t minus t, then this system is time invariant. If it is not, then this system is not time invariant. We call it time variance system, okay? How do we do that? Go to this y of t, I replace every t by t minus capital T. What's going to happen here? Yeah. So I need now to see what's y of t minus capital T. It's equal to what from this equation? Hmm. Yeah. Exactly. dx of t minus capital T by dt. Right? Okay. Is this... The same as what we got when we shifted the input? Yes. 
Yes. So this system is time invariant. خلاص. طيب. Let's take it. Any questions? Let's take an example because sometimes you look at this and you say, "Oh, this is going to be true for any other system." No, let's look at this system. Y of t, the other one, this one, is equal to x of t multiplied by unit step of t. Okay. First operation. Let's see what's going to be the output for a shifted input, right? So that's the first operation. So let's try to put x of t minus capital T. And see what's going to be the output. The output in that case is going to be what? Hmm. X of t. How does the system treat any input? It multiplies that by a unit step, right? So the input now is x of t minus capital T, and it has to be multiplied by a unit step of t because I only shifted the input, right? I didn't really change all the time variables in the equation. I only shifted the input, right? Okay. So that's going to be the output. This is the output for an input shifted. This is what I will get for a shifted input. Okay. Now let's test what is y of t minus capital T from this equation. Hmm. T minus t. Yes. Times u of t minus t. Exactly. So if we look at this, we will find that this is equal to x. Take every t in the equation and replace it by t minus capital T. So x of t minus capital T, u of t minus capital T. Is this equal to this? No. no. So the system is not time invariant. Yes. I didn't get it right. Uh, the unit step here is different than the unit step. Not here. Yeah, for example, the unit step here, I would have t minus t capital. Here? Ah, but we have to do the unit step. We have to do the operation. We have to do it here to test. Is to simply shift the input. The system is not aware that I shifted the input. So we have to change the parameters. We have to change the system. I'm only changing the input, right? The U of T here is part of the system operation, not part of the input. Amen? So this is why when I shifted the input, I should not touch this. On the other side, I'm looking at the output, which is a combination of the input and the system parameters, when I shift myself. So I'm looking at shifted output. What would happen? In all the output operation, replace every T with T minus. So this includes both. So you have to step that is input. مش كانبوت الاكس هي اللي انبوت يونت ستيب از بارت اوف ذا سيستم اوبريشن لا في الواي ولا هنا اعتبرناها انبوت طب ليش عوض ده عشان احنا وي ار نوت شيفتنج ذا انبوت وي ار لوكينج ات ا شيفتد اوتبوت ويتش از اوريدي برودوسد فروم اكس تايمز يو اند اف اي شيفتد ايفريثينج شيفتس ويز ات لانه الاوتبوت كده اوكي يو جوت ذا ايديا ايفري ون اوكي يس No, no, we have many other systems. Derivatives, we have been through something like derivatives. Maybe integral, maybe root square, maybe multiplication of different input with a constant. Many other operations. Yeah, okay. so like um, most of them are like element, like things you know already. The unit step is something new, so that's why you focus on it a little bit extra. But uh, most of the other things are things that you have been exposed to before, integrating the, the derivative, whatever. You have been through this many times in, in other aspects, right? So. So they should be fine. You don't need to learn something new about them. Don't worry. Okay. You will see, for example, in the in the next uh, slide, okay, that we will deal with uh, like this is an operation, and we will test for a certain property, and it's going to be something that you know already that allows you to figure out that test. Okay. Another important property of you know, another important property of systems is. I think it should be dynamic, not dynamic. Okay. So that's, there's a mistake there. Okay. Uh, another important property of systems is whether a system is instantaneous or dynamic. We say a system is instantaneous if the output at any point in time depends only on the input at that exact point, not anything before, not anything after. Okay? So if I look at a system and the output y of, for example, this system, y of t, is equal to 3x of t. The output at any time t depends only at the, on the input at the same time t, right? But, but if I had something like this, y of t is equal to 3x of t minus 1, or 3x of t plus 1, this means that the output at t, right, depends on the previous point in time 
or the coming point in time, not the exact point in time. So these cases are not instantaneous systems. This is an instantaneous system. A non-instantaneous system, we call it dynamic, because it either relies on future or past. Now, the next slide is going to talk about something called causality, which says that if a system depends on current time and history only, so past only, that's called a causal system. Right? If it depends on anything in the future, it's not causal. So you can think of causality as like a property that intersects with dynamic and, and uh, instantaneous, right? Okay. So instantaneous, you depend only at the current point. Previous and, and future, no. Causal, you can depend on the current or the history, but you cannot depend on the future. Okay? Let's look at a quick example and we'll stop there. There is a couple of more properties, but I will leave them to next time. Um, let's look at this ex example. Y of t minus 1 is equal to 2x of t minus 1. Is this instantaneous or not? Yes. Hmm. yes. Any other opinions? By the way, testing for instantaneous is just by looking at the equation. It, it doesn't have formal ways like what we did for the previous properties. Okay? So yes, because at any time t, right? let's say t equals 3, then I look at y of 2. It relies on x of 2, because when t equals 3 here, it is x of 2. So y of 0 relies on x of 0, because if I put this 1, and also 0, 1, then it becomes 0, 0, right? So always the output at any point in time relies on the input at the same point in time, even though the time variable is shifted in both sides, right? But still, it, it is an instantaneous system. Let's look at this one. This is instantaneous or not? No. Uh, that's a trick. Right? Again, we are only looking at the output time and the input time. We don't care about this. This is just a system parameter. It has nothing to do with the input. Okay? So yes, the output at any point in time relies on the input at the same time. This part is not the input. It's just a constant that depends where am I in time. But it's a constant. It's a system effect, not an input effect. Okay? So this is also instantaneous. What about this guy? Yes or no? Yes. No. Why? No, because uh, it's not uh, the parameter x, it's the derivative of it. Yeah, so? So if we derive it, derivate it, it will not be t. You are close, but that's not the formal answer. The formal answer is, remember the definition of the derivative, right? Mm -hmm. Remember when you did the derivative in your first calculus course, you were talking about the value at a certain point, and the value at a point immediately before, or immediately after. And then you take the limit and those two points come closer to each other, right? So generally speaking, in the definition of the derivative, you do not rely on the exact point only. You have to use something before it or something after it, right? So by definition, the derivative is not affected by only the point in time that I'm dealing with. You have to, only, you have to also take some incremental back in order to calculate the slope of the line, right? So again, without doing any mathematics, just by definition, the derivative relies on the current value and an immediate previous history, right? So this means that the output relies on the current and a historical value. I will stop here. Uh, if you have questions or something, we can do it next time, inshallah. And so continuing from where we stopped last time, I think we have been through this one already. The, um, the dynamic versus instantaneous. And we said that the definition for uh, an instantaneous system is a system where the output at any point in time relies on the input at the exact same point in time. Okay, so for example, this one, where we have the output at t minus 1, we see that it relies at the input at the same time, t minus 1. So this is an instantaneous system. Or if it was y of t equals something x of t. Again, instantaneous. We looked also at this one, uh, part c. Uh, as we said last time, when you look at this case, right, you only care about output time and input time. This part does not matter to you when you are trying to figure out whether a system is instantaneous or not. So basically, again, if we apply the rule, the output at any point in time t relies on the input at the exact same point. Nothing in the future, nothing in the past, even though this part has a different 
um, time value, but it has nothing to do with the time of the input or the time of the output. It's just a constant calculated based on at which time location you are or at which time instant you are. So it doesn't affect neither the input time nor the output time. So again, this system is instantaneous as well because the output at any point in time relies on the input at the exact same point in time. What about the case of y of t is equal to the derivative of x of t? You think that this is instantaneous or not? Yes, no? Why no? Hmm? We already said no. Yeah, fine. Why no? Any answer? So again, what's the definition of the derivative? Remember the derivative? When you studied that in your first course in calculus, so d by t, dt, d by dt of x of t was defined as the limit, right? As delta t goes to zero of x of t minus x of t minus delta t, right? Divided by delta t. So you see that the derivative relies on two time instants, the current time instant and the one immediately before. So when you take the limit as delta t goes to zero, this becomes just two adjacent points on a continuous line, right? So this means that this does not rely at time on time t only because it's a derivative. It relies on time t and something slightly before, right? So that's not instantaneous. Why? Because from the definition of the derivative, this is what we can deduce, okay? Another important property of a system is something called the causality of a system. Whether a system is causal or non-causal. There is a bit of overlap between an instantaneous and causal system. An instantaneous system relies only so a system is instantaneous if it relies only at the same time, like the output relies on an input, which happens exactly at the same time. For causal system, the, a system is causal if the output at any point in time t relies on the input at that point or anything in the past, but nothing in the future, right? So if we want to kind of visualize instantaneous, this is instantaneous. This is the output. So this is time scale. The output at time t relies on the input at the exact same time, right? This is called instantaneous, okay? For a causal system, the output at time t relies on input at that time or any previous input, right? If this is the point where the output happens, right? So in this case, this is a causal system. If there is a reliance on anything in the future, this is a non-causal system, okay? While for instantaneous, if there is any reliance on past or future, it's not instantaneous, Amen? So you can think that any instantaneous system is actually a causal system, right? Because the definition of causal says what? It relies on the same point or history. Right? So instantaneous still satisfies that because it relies on the same location. But not every causal system is an instantaneous system because causal system can have history. Instantaneous cannot have history. Okay? Any non-causal system is definitely not instantaneous because any non-causal system, it must rely on the future. And the same instantaneous cannot rely on the future. Okay? So there is an overlap between instantaneous and causal system. Anyways, um, the figure here shows you that, again, we can either figure out whether a particular system is, in, uh, is causal or not by looking at the input-output relation. So in this case, we see that the output at time t, right, is equal to the input at history. That's fine. But then added to it the input at t plus 2. That's a future. So this is definitely a non-causal system, okay? Halas Yabanat, this one is non-causal. One way to figure it out by looking at the system equation, 
The other way to figure it out by looking at the output from the system. We know that in all our like practical systems, the input always, or knowing that the input always starts at time zero, right? Before time zero, we don't have any input, okay? Or whenever we have an input, we start that input saying that the start of the input is what we consider our reference time zero, okay? Now, if you put some input to a system, and then without even knowing the equation, if you look at the output from the system, and you find that the output has non-zero value at something before the occurrence of the input, so here we have an output value between minus 2 and minus 1, right? And this comes before zero, which is the start of the input, right? So definitely this system is non-causal because it produced some output even before having an input, which means that it produced this by looking into something in the future because the input only started here, right? I know that the input starts here, right? And without having an input, there shouldn't be any output. However, when I look at this system, I see that I have an output before the start of the input. So this output must be produced by the system doing what? Looking at something that happened during this. It calculated some value here from future input because the input only occurred here. Right? So this is a system that is somewhat looking into the future. So it's a non-causal system. Okay? So one of two ways, either you have the system equation and then you check output at time t, input before, that's okay. This is input after in the future, so that's not okay. So this system is definitely not causal, right? Or if I have an input figure and an output figure and I find that from the output figure there are some values of the output at time before the occurrence of the input, then this is definitely non-causal, okay? If it was causal, it would have been that you can only see y of t from zero ongoing, but there is no value for y of t before the occurrence of the input, okay? So one of two ways allows you to figure out whether a system is causal or not. Any questions? Yes? No. An instantaneous system looks at only this point in time, right? Mm. So this satisfies the causality, mm. right? If it's non-causal, it means there is something in the future that the system relies on. And this already violates the instantaneous property, okay? So it cannot. Okay. Another property, not very important to us, but uh, we need to know it. Anyways, and I will tell you at the end of those properties what are the most important and critical properties for us to be able to figure out. This property is called the invertibility of a system. A system is invertible if I can find a way to deduce the input from the output, right? An example of that, right? This system, y of t equals x of minus t. If I want to figure out x of t as a function of y of t, can I find that relation? Yeah, x of t is equal to y of minus t. And it's valid for all values of t, right? So this is an invertible system. Another important invertible system is something like this. y of t is equal to 3x of t. Can I find x of t as a function of y of t for all possible values of t? Yes, x of t is equal to one-third y of t, right? So by applying this to whatever output I get, I can figure out the input for all values of time, right? So that's an invertible system. What about this system? y of t equals t x of t. Is this invertible or not? Hmm? x of t is equal to 1 over t, y of t, right? Exactly. So this is invertible? No, because it violates the invertibility at t equals 0. At time t equals 0, this equation is not valid. I cannot get anything out of it. So this means that even though for any other time value, 
this equation is applicable, but unfortunately, at t equals zero is not applicable, which means that, in general, this system is not invertible. Because at some values of time, I cannot really figure out the output by knowing the input, okay? Because I try, if I try to apply this equation, it will blow out. It will give me infinity, right? Unmeasurable, undetermined value. So this is not invertible, okay? Last but not least is, I think I updated this slide. This is the one that we used in the lecture, but the one on your blackboard is more updated than this one. Anyways, uh, but the information is more or less the same. So uh, stability of a system, and that's very important property for any engineering application, okay? There are many definitions for stability. As far as we are concerned in this course, we care about something called the bounded input, bounded output stability, or BIBO, B-I-B-O, okay? What does it mean? A system is stable if I can show or if I can guarantee that for any input that has a maximum value, does not exceed a certain maximum value, the output also is not going to exceed a certain maximum value. So for any bounded input, what does it mean to have a bounded input? That the amplitude of the input has a maximum value. It doesn't just keep growing forever. Okay? So for example, this is not a bounded input, just for your information. This is not a bounded input, right? Because as, as time goes on, the input keeps growing, right? So it's not a bounded input. However, a sinusoidal function, for example, is a bounded input because I know that there is a maximum amplitude that I will never exceed, right? Or some curve that looks like this, right? And it never exceeds this value. That's a bounded input. Or the unit step function, that's a bounded input. So all of these functions, the sinusoid, this one, which is uh, approaching a fixed upper limit, or that one, the unit step, all of these are bounded inputs, right? Now, a system is going to be stable if for any of those or any other bounded inputs, the output from that system is also bounded. It doesn't keep growing, okay? On the other side, if, uh, if for a particular system, I can put a bounded input and the output keeps growing, that's not a stable system. That's an unstable system, okay? Uh, an example of an unstable system is this system that we see here, the integrator system. Why this is an unstable system? Because if you try to calculate the output for a unit step function, what happens in this system? What's going to be the output for a unit step function? So x, assume that x of t is the unit step. What's the integral from minus infinity up to t unit step of tau d tau, which is this in integral? What's going to be the value here? What's going to be your y of t? Hmm. How would it look like? What's the unit step? It's zero for any negative value, and it's one for any positive value, right? So this integral from minus infinity up to zero is going to give me nothing. Because in that case, the unit step is equal to zero. Starting from zero up to any upper value t is going to give me an integration of one, which is a rising linear function, right? So the output from this is going to look like this. And before, zero, right? So that's how it looks like, right? Now you can see that the output keeps growing forever, right? even though the input is a unit step which is bounded. So this system is stable or unstable? Unstable. unstable, right? Because for a bounded input, which is the unit step function, it produces unbounded output, which is the ramp function, right? Okay? Any questions? Great. So we are done with... Uh, the properties of systems, again, the real important ones, I mean, all of them are important, but the ones that we really care about, I'm going to summarize them right now. So we have four important properties. Number one, the linearity, very important for us. Number two, the time invariance. Okay, number three, the causality of a system. 
and last but not least, the stability of the system. I mean, all the other properties are also, you need to know how to do them and so on, but as we continue with the course, these are the ones that are gonna stay with us and we need to be aware of them. So, causal system. Why a causal system is important to us? Because practical systems, in general, they cannot really predict the future. So we have to keep in mind that whenever we are trying to create a system and model it mathematically, we have to keep in, in mind that practically it always has to be causal, right? Predicting the future is not possible except in very specific situations. When you are dealing, for example, let's say that you are dealing with recorded data, right? Rather than data that comes to you as time goes on. Now, if you are dealing with recorded data, of course, you have access to like, and you are processing the current value on, on a particular tape or a particular film, you still have access to the future and the past, right? But in general, most of the time, we are dealing only with causal systems that cannot predict the future. They can only rely on current or historical values, okay? So that's why we care about causality. Stability, we just discussed it. I mean, for any application, you desire your system to be stable, otherwise, it's a system which is very risky and can blow out if you keep it running. Because as you keep it running, for a particular limited input, it will keep growing the output, and then at some point, it will either saturate or burn or whatever, okay? So stability is also important. Time invariance and linearity are basic two properties that we assume in every single system that we will deal with, starting from the next moment after finishing this slide and starting the new ones we will only deal with linear time invariant systems. So we'll be always dealing with LTI systems. Linear time invariant. So that's why we care about those two properties as well. Okay? We mentioned a bit about uh, the advantages of dealing with linear systems, right? Particularly when we talked about a linear system possess poss possessing the uh, decomposition property and some other nice mathematical properties we will Ex, uh, explore this a little bit further as we continue uh, into the new part, right? And uh, those two are of very practical importance. So this, those four properties are really pillars that we need to keep them in mind. Uh, instantaneous and uh, with memory doesn't matter that much to us. Invertible and not invertible is not really a key issue for us, at least in this course. In other courses, they might become more important, okay?